verse 1. Uh, today's study is going to be on the will of God. Uh, why is doing the will of God important? And it's the beginning of a series on the subject of the will of God. <clears throat> Psalm 19. Now these were songs. Uh, this one is written. by King David. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run his race. It rises in from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Verse 12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. So we've seen the emphasis on the testimony of creation, and then the emphasis on the giving of the law and God's purpose with it, laid out very clearly. And this was very appropriate for the time in which David lived. That part in that place in God's uh, progressive revelation. And then he asked this wonderful question, which uh, who can understand his heirs? And none of us really can. Uh, even if we can determine what they are, how you fix them, that's another problem. And uh, God's the answer. Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we thank you, Father, that there are 66 books. And you are providing truth for every generation. We thank you, Father, how this plan of salvation has unfolded since the fall, pointing out that you and you alone can cleanse. The problem is too big for us, and salvation is only of the Lord. Uh, thank you, Father, for your word. Uh, thank you for all that you have provided us in this dispensation of the grace of God. 
We thank you, Father, for the salvation that has been accomplished, not promised only, but accomplished, and that we are positionally as believers seated in the heavenlies, and as we are communicating now with you, that communication as we are walking in the spirit is heard in the very throne room of God. As we come to the throne of grace, we realize we need your help and understanding. We thank you, Father, for our inner tutor. May we listen to what the spirit is trying to point as out as we study together. I direct to your glory, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Do we have a Sunday school teacher this morning? Probably not. Um, I'd like you to turn to Psalm 8. And we're looking at the first four verses here. <clears throat> As to our study, but I'd like for us, for us to read the whole song. To the chief musician on the instrument of Gath, a psalm of David, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I considered your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? And that's going to be our focus today. Verse five. For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. We're very small as you contemplate the universe and all that God has created. We are bit of just a little tiny speck. And yet God has made us to be on center stage in his plan and program. Notice that we are lower than the angels. Notice that he's crowned us, mankind, with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. We get to use all the things and uh, that he's created here on this planet for our benefit. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O Lord, 
Our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And so I'm thinking on this. I don't know if this is going to work at all. I haven't tried it. <laughs> and I sent uh, them a text. I'll tell you where it's coming from. Uh, there is a set that uh, Tim McCone, I think he's letting me maybe use them. He handed them, me with the Christmas card. So I don't know, is this my present or not? I'm not really sure about that. <laughs> So I don't want to presume that. Uh, and I know he had, he had listened to them, so they were open packages. And I, I, I've listened to the first one. And each one's 100. This one here is 110, which I think is the longest. It's a three set. And it's called, What Aren't You Being Told About Astronomy? The heavens declare the glory of God. They are, God, they are God speaking, communicating visually. An amazing picture book, constant rev revelation. Now, they don't give you specifics because we need the word of God. We need, as the, the verse we read a little earlier, the question is, why do you even bother with us? You know, what? what why are you interested in us? Why do you visit us? And down through time, we have in the scriptures indicating where God communicated with man. And so that will be the next stage. Uh, this is just this one form of, of communication, and we can't help but spill over into the other thing, but we won't, it's not the main emphasis. I want us to be able to hear this and, and to realize that Satan has tried desperately in our world uh, to silence this voice. Uh, this is not, I uh, you know, evolution was out there, but the force of it is not the same as when I was a kid. I do not face the things that my grandchildren are facing. The power is in the word of God, and this is one form of the word of God. Uh, people can be creationists and not saved. It was interesting. I was looking on the YouTube on creation, and there I saw the Muslims and the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses with all their information, too, and uh, creation information. So just being a creationist doesn't make you right with God. And many people really believe in Jesus Christ's deity. We'll look at that in our next one. I think we'll focus on a couple of different portions that I'll mention at the end of our notes. Uh, so this is about the, this one here happens to be about our created uh, solar system. It's called uh, "What Are You Not Being Told About Astronomy?" Uh, volume One, and then uh, it's by Spike Lazarus. I think that's close enough, and you can get information at www.creationastronomy.com. That's creationastronomy, one word, dot com. And that's where this is, is being portrayed right here is this site. And they are giving you little clips of two things on, the, on this first volume and then providing you a means by which you can order and uh, I, uh, there's so much information, 110 minutes, uh, but it's very good because it really shows the holes. You know, it's like it's going someplace and you're trying to get information about something and they're only giving you the, one, the things that they want you to hear and the things that are a problem, they just kind of 
just skip over that information. Or they uh, just slightly pause to mention something about it, maybe on occasion, because it is a fact that they can't uh, overlook completely. Because many scientists have uh, have adopted this theory of evolution and really have not done the study on the facts, as I understand from people in the. Uh, and it doesn't mean that they and that they have even some have come to the idea there had to be a creator, but that doesn't mean they became a believer. And some have become Christians, but unfortunately, they're not really saved because they really haven't hear, heard and, and understood what God has said. They're not interested in submitting that far. And so if you exchange one form of world philosophy for another, right, you still end up with a world philosophy. And so the danger uh, in the book of Colossians, uh, Paul so vehemently stated in the second chapters, Watch out, you're going to get cheated. You're going to get swindled. And so this is important for us to understand that people out there need to hear this. We need to understand their problem, what they're facing. This uh, man uh, was previously an engineer in the U United States military space program. He entered this uh, program as an atheist and, a, and an evolutionist. He left it as a creationist and a Christian. Okay, let's see what happens here. For thousands of years, mankind has looked for space. It's been less than a century that we could actually travel there. A few centuries ago, almost all scientists believed in the biblical account of creation. However, by the time the first astronaut launched into space, Many scientists had abandoned this history. Many astronomers had come to believe that our solar system and the planets and moons within it formed all by themselves without a creator about four and a half billion years ago. But what did we find when we arrived in space? Did the planets and moons of our solar system actually support this belief? Or are they consistent with the Bible instead? The answer to this question might surprise you. Welcome to what you aren't being told about astronomy, volume one. I created Solar Tail. I'm Spike Pissaris, your host. For a number of years, I worked as an engineer in the U.S. military space program. I entered that program as an atheist and an evolutionist. I left it as a creationist and a Christian. In this video, we'll discover some of the evidences that have convinced me, along with many others, that the Bible is true and evolution is not. I'll be your guide as we tour the solar system together. We'll see stunning pictures and movies of planets, moons, and other objects. Some are our next door neighbors in space. Others are vast distances away. We'll discover that often these objects do not support evolutionary ideas. Many of them appear to be quite young, not billions of years old. In fact, according to the current evolutionary models, many of the objects in our solar system cannot exist at all. Now that probably contradicts everything you've heard before. You've probably been told that evolutionary astronomers have it all figured out, and that their models prove that our solar system formed all by itself billions of years ago. Well, you'll have to hear the evidence to judge for yourself. In this video, you'll discover what you're not being told about our solar system. So let's get started. Before we can talk about how our solar system got here, 
we need to clarify exactly what the solar system is. When we talk about the solar system, we're talking about our sun and everything that orbits around it. This includes the eight major planets in our solar system, along with many moons, asteroids, comets, and smaller objects as well. By the way, this diagram is not scale. In this video, we'll be discussing all the planets and some of their moons in our solar system. In order from the sun, the planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto is a special case that we'll be discussing later. Here's what the planets would look like if you could line them all up next to the sun. In real life, the planets are much farther away from the sun and each other than this. But I wanted to show you how big the planets are compared to each other in the sun. By the way, you are here. So where did the system come from? There are two competing models for the origin of our solar system. This is a pretty straightforward issue. Either the solar system was created or it wasn't. In this video, I'm going to use the word evolution describe the belief that our solar system was not created. This word is often used to describe biological evolution, of course, but astronomers commonly use it in a broader meaning as well. So when I use the word evolution, I'm not talking about plants or animals. I'm talking about the belief that our solar system and everything in it formed and developed all by itself. I used to believe in evolution, but not anymore. I now believe that the entire universe and everything in it, including our solar system, was created by God as described in the Bible. Of course, many scientists today disagree strongly with this idea. These men and women believe that no creation occurred. They believe that the solar system formed billions of years ago without the Creator being involved. In this video, you'll discover why their model is wrong. Of course, this won't prove that the creation model is right. It's impossible to use science to prove any historical event happened. All we can do is see which scenario fits the evidence the best. And that's what this video is all about. Most people have been told that all the evidence points toward evolution. As we clear the solar system together, ask yourself this question. Are the planets and moons consistent with these evolutionary ideas or not? I think you'll see that the answer is no. I think you'll see that the evidence is perfectly consistent with the creation viewpoint instead. So let's discuss these two important models. The creation model is based on the Bible. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible doesn't give us a specific date for this event, but from other passages in the Bible, we can calculate that this would have been about 6,000 years ago. On the other hand, some who believe in evolution denies the biblical account. The dominant evolutionary model today is called the solar nebula model. According to this model, our solar system formed from a screwy cloud of gas and dust about 4.5 to 4.6 billion years ago. The evolutionary story goes something like this. In the beginning, there was gas. About 4.6 billion years ago, the enormous cloud of gas collapsed and started to swirl. Most of the gas went into the middle and became our sun. The rest of it swirled around the new sun and started to condense into grains of dust. As the grains of dust orbited the sun, it started to stick together and became clumps of dust. Then the clumps stuck together to become little rocks. Little rocks stuck together to become big rocks. After enough time had passed, the gas had turned into huge asteroids. These asteroids stuck together to become the planets today. Astronomers have a special name for these asteroids. They're called planetesimals, which means little planets. Since you probably haven't heard this word before, I'm going to call them asteroids instead. It means basically the same thing anyway. For example, most secular astronomers believe that the asteroids we see in our solar system today are leftover planetesimals that never quite got it together to form planets. Evolutionists are confident that their model is correct. After all, it explains why all the planets orbit the sun in the same direction. It also explains why the solar system is black today, with all the planets lining up in a disk shape as they orbit the sun. Plus, it explains why the inner planets are rocky, and the outer planets are made of gas and ice. Supposedly, the heavier rocky materials were able to condense close to the sun, while the lighter materials were more volatile and only condensed further away from the sun. Sounds good, doesn't it? The problem is that it doesn't work. It turns out that you can't build planets like the evolutionists say. You can build clumps of dust, certainly. We know that dust particles stick together. Just look under your furniture and see the dust bunnies have for proof. 
Mm -hmm. Experiments in space have shown that dust bunnies will form in a vacuum too. Problem is that once you have big clumps of dust, and maybe even they don't grow together anymore, they start impacting each other too fast to stick together. Instead, they start breaking each other up in the collisions. Gravity isn't strong enough to overcome this until after the rocks have formed into small asteroids. So, despite the fancy computer animations you see on science videos, there's no way to get from dust clumps to plants. Evolutionary astronomers know this is true. That's why you see quotes like this one in astronomy textbooks. Once these planetesimals have been formed, further growth of planets may occur through the gravitational accretion of the large bodies, which is how that takes place. Not for sure. And in the scientific you journal, catch that? You see comments like this. Yeah. The formation of planetesimals, kilometer sized planetary precursors, is still a puzzling process. How the first stage of this process, primary accretion, works is a fundamental unsolved problem in planetary science. So before we even discuss any planets or moons, the evolutionary theory is breaking down already. It can't produce the asteroids it needs to build planets. Will it do any better when we examine the actual planets and moons themselves? Let's take a look and see. That's the video. <clears throat> okay. Okay, let's see if I can. Jupiter is sometimes called the king of the planets, <laughs> the largest planet in our solar system. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are giants too. They're all much bigger than the Earth, as you can see. But Jupiter is by far the biggest. Jupiter has beautiful, intricate clouds swirling over its entire surface. It also has a famous feature called the Great Red Spot. The Red Spot is a huge storm system swirling on Jupiter. This has existed for about as long as we've had telescopes to look at it, so it's hundreds of years old at least. It might even have been there since Jupiter was created. All of as you can see, this one storm is bigger than the entire Earth. Jupiter also has huge electrical storms on its surface. Jupiter is a violent place. Just like all the other planets, Jupiter confounds evolutionary models of our solar system. To produce a planet this big, you need a lot of raw materials, and the evolutionary model can't supply them. According to the evolutionary model, Jupiter had to form a bit differently than the Earth. Like the Earth, it supposedly started with the planetesimals or asteroids, formed in the solar nebula and gathered together. But unlike the Earth, these planetesimals had enough mass, and therefore enough gravity, to collect lots of gas from the solar nebula too. Then, after several million years of gas collecting, Jupiter had formed. Well, that doesn't work for several reasons. First of all, as we've already seen, the secular model can't make asteroids out of gas and dust. As one paper commented, the process by which sub-micrometer-sized protoplanetary dust particles evolve to kilometer-sized planetesimals is still enigmatic. Another admitted that the process by which planetesimals can form is unknown. In fact, not only are there problems building large asteroids, models can't even produce small ones. As a JPL NASA press release explained, the problem with this tiny little theory is that when the burgeoning space rocks grew to about one meter in size, orbital mechanics tells us the gas co-mingling with them in the protoplanetary disk could have acted like a brain, slowing their velocity appreciably. Their orbital speed hadn't been cut. These filing cabinet-sized space rocks would have spiraled into the sun. So even if small planetesimals managed to form, they would have been destroyed fairly quickly. As a paper in Nature pointed out, how this process continues from meter-sized boulders to kilometer-scale planetesimals is a major unsolved problem. Boulders are expected to stick together poorly and to spiral into the protostar in a few hundred orbits, owing to a headwind from the slower rotating gas. So the secular model can't make planetesimals. But without planetesimals, the secular model can't explain any of the planets, including Jupiter. And even if you planetesimals, secular scientists have discovered that they still couldn't explain Jupiter because its chemical composition doesn't match their models. Evolutionary models say 
that Jupiter should have very little of certain elements, argon, krypton, xenon, and others. But we discovered that Jupiter has about three times as much of these elements as evolutionists had expected. According to secular models, Jupiter can't have these elements in the concentrations that we observe because those elements can't have been in Jupiter's region of the solar system back when Jupiter was forming. According to the models, the only place that these elements are allowed to have formed is way out beyond the orbit of Neptune, more than 3 billion miles from where Jupiter is today. To try and solve this problem, some evolutionists have suggested that Jupiter must have formed way out there and then moved inward. But this doesn't make sense for several reasons. Among other things, the secular model says there wouldn't have been enough material out there for Jupiter to assemble from. Others have suggested that the unexpected elements came from planetesimals, or asteroids, that formed way out there and then moved billions of miles inward, delivering these elements to Jupiter. But that doesn't work either. If they had formed out there and then moved in, they would have warmed up as they moved toward the sun. And as they got warmer, they would have lost whatever argon, krypton, and xenon they contained. As some secular researchers commented, it remains to be shown how planetesimals that form at the very low temperatures required to explain the observations could have found their way to Jupiter. The secular model can't account for Jupiter. The planet as we see it today just shouldn't be there, but there it is. An article in the scientific journal Nature discussed this problem. An overview of that article said, Jupiter is the largest of all the planets. The results in Nature now reveal the embarrassing fact that we know next to nothing about how or where it formed. Overall, according to the secular model, it seems that Jupiter should exist. But of course it does. As one report said, talk about a major embarrassment for planetary scientists. There, blazing away in the late evening sky, are Jupiter and Saturn, gas giants that account for 93% of the solar system's planetary mass, and no one has a satisfying explanation of how they were made. Well, that last part isn't true. The Bible has a very satisfying explanation of how they were made. But now that evolutionists have rejected the Bible, their only explanation for these planets is lots of shoulder shrugging. Jupiter has over 60 moons. They pose problems for evolution, too. Let's take a look at the four biggest ones. From upper left clockwise, we have Io, Europa, Callisto, Ganymede. Ganymede is the largest of Jupiter's moons. It's even bigger than the planet Mercury. Ganymede has one of the most bizarre surfaces in our entire solar system. It's crisscrossed with ridges and grooved terrain, but with weird patterns speaking across it all. Some places are rough and rocky, other places are flat and smooth. It almost looks like somebody took a giant paintbrush and painted huge swipes across the surface. But this isn't the only challenge Ganymede poses for people who try to explain how it formed without a creator. Evolutionary models predicted that Ganymede couldn't have a magnetic field. But when our space probes arrived and started taking measurements, we found that it does have a magnetic field. Ganymede doesn't match the evolutionary model at all. Then there's Callisto. This moon is the most heavily cratered object in the solar system. Evolutionists believe that it has one of the oldest surfaces of any object, about 4 billion years old. It was a real surprise then when our space probes took some close-up pictures. Evolutionists expected a large number of smaller craters to go with the big ones, but they aren't there. They should be there if the surface is really billions of years old, but they're not. Callisto doesn't match the evolutionary cratering model. Not only that, some of the pictures show what appears to be fresh ice on Callisto's surface. This means that there's still erosion and geological activity going on. Evolutionary models say that Callisto is old, cold, and dead. But apparently, that's not true. Next, there's Europa. Europa is, in some ways, the opposite of Callisto. Callisto is the most heavily cratered object in the solar system. Europa is the smoothest. Not only are there very few craters, Europa has very little terrain of any kind. It's almost perfectly smooth. The entire moon is covered with a shell of ice. The ice is several miles thick, but some scientists believe there might be liquid water beneath it. And where there's water, there has to be life, right? We already talked about how ridiculous that idea is, but nevertheless, we still hear it in the news a lot. Somebody finds a new crack on Europa and thinks, ooh, look, water might lose up into the crack, and there might be life evolving in the water. Then some reporter runs a story about it that says we're on the verge of finding life elsewhere in the solar system, even though all we found was a crack in the moon. 
That sounds ridiculous, but it happens a lot in astronomy. Because Europa has only a few craters, we've been able to study them closely. One recent study has shown that the evolutionary model for cratering is all wrong. We've talked about cratering before. We've seen that evolutionists like to use craters to date things in the solar system. After all, the more craters something has, the longer it's been sitting there and getting struck by other objects. Well, this study discovered that the impact of just one object could throw up debris and form lots and lots of craters. Scientists had already known this was possible, but evolutionists didn't expect the effect to be this large. The study showed that up to 95% of small craters and a lot of the medium ones were formed in this way. This means that these planets and moons have been struck with a lot fewer impacts than evolutionists thought. And that calls into question all of those billions of years that these objects have supposedly been around. Remember that Venus' surface looks very young? but its crater supposedly proved it's a half billion years old? Now we know this isn't true. And craters are also used to support the old age of the Earth's moon. Supposedly, our moon needed billions of years to accumulate all of its craters. Thanks to Europa, we now know this isn't true. The scientists in this study specifically said the Europa results caused problems with the current accepted age of Earth's moon. Isn't it interesting that one small moon in Jupiter, so far away from us, and wreck evolutionary models of even our own moon. The last moon of Jupiter that we'll be discussing is Io. Compared to Jupiter, Io is an insignificant speck of a moon. But it's turned out to be one of the most spectacular places in the solar system. Io's surface is covered with volcanoes. All the spots you see on its surface here are volcanic. Over 400 volcanoes have been counted on Io, and at least 150 of them are active today. The black spot you see here is a volcano named Loki. It's more powerful than all the Earth's volcanoes combined. Volcanoes in Iowa can be incredibly violent. We've seen fountains of lava blasting material 180 miles into space. We've also measured geysers of lava shooting out of the volcanoes at over 2,000 miles per hour. That's more than 10 times as fast as the most violent volcanoes in our Earth. Io gives us some fascinating insights on the long age evolutionary theories. For example, Io puts out twice as much heat as the Earth does. Where does all this heat come from? Well, some of it comes from tidal flexing. Io is caught in a gravitational tug of war between Jupiter on the one side and Jupiter's other large moons on the other. They're both pulling on Io, and this squeezing and flexing is generating heat inside Io's interior. The problem is that this squeezing can only account for some of Io's heat. So where does the rest of the heat come from? Well, if Io was young, it could still be cooling off from its initial formation. But if it's really billions of years old, that energy would have dissipated long ago. So, according to evolutionary theory, Io shouldn't have all those active volcanoes you see on its surface, but it does. Io's volcanoes create another problem for the models of billions of years. We've measured the lavas coming from the volcanoes. There's an amazing amount of it. The Imerani volcano alone, which you see here, is flooding the moon's surface with 100 cubic meters of lava per second. It's erupting like that continuously. And this isn't even the biggest volcano on Earth. For example, look at these before and after pictures of the Kalan Matera. Between the times these photos were taken, there was a massive eruption that produced a dark spot you see on the upper right. That's a huge lava flow, about as big as the state of Nevada. And these flows happen quickly. We saw a different volcano produce almost this much lava in just two days. Has Io really been erupting like this for four and a half million years? We've measured some of these flows coming out of these volcanoes, and it's a huge amount of material. If Io really was four and a half million years old, it would have recycled itself through its own volcanoes over 30 times. Surely Io can't be billions of years old. And there's another problem, too. We've studied volcanoes on Earth, and the lava here reach amazing temperatures. 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. At least these temperatures seemed amazing until we examined Io. Evolutionists were flabbergasted with the discovery that some of the lavas on Io are almost 1,000 degrees hotter than Earth's lavas. They're also very dense. So here's the problem for evolution. If Io really was millions of years old, these temperatures and densities wouldn't be possible. After the first few million years, Io should have formed a low-density crust. After all, the higher density material sank down to the inside. But there are still high density materials on the surface. 
Forget about millions of years. Iowa apparently isn't even millions of years old. Iowa looks quite young. It matches perfectly with the biblical account of creation just a few thousand years ago. And that brings us to the end of our discussion on Jupiter. So let's review. Here's what you're not being told about Jupiter. According to the secular model, Jupiter can't be made up of the materials it's made up of. In fact, the model can't account for any of the planetesimals that Jupiter was supposedly built from. Therefore, it can't count the planet itself. Ganymede shouldn't have a magnetic field, but it does. Callisto shouldn't be geologically active, but it is. Europa shows that long-age crater counting methods are wrong, and Iowa looks very young. Evolutionary models fail utterly to explain Jupiter. That's why evolutionists make complaints like this one. Building Jupiter has long been a problem for theorists. Or this one. I don't think the existence of Jupiter would be predicted if it weren't observed. So why do they still cling to a broken model? Because when you reject the truth, you have to accept the lie. Many of the poor evolutionists who is so committed to a bankrupt theory that you can't see the hand of his creator in his majestic planet. And you can get them for fifteen dollars a piece, right? This site. Okay. To our notes. So let's assume you all believe in creation. So you've heard that part, you believe God on that. you would be ready for the second message. So this one is actually pointing out to someone probably that is having problems with this and why it's important for him to find out in his own thinking and realization that there is a creature, creator that provided all the creation around us. Okay, <clears throat> why is doing the will of God important? Psalm 8, 1. Through four. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? What is at stake for every human being? Our eternal destiny. We'll be looking at Second Peter chapter three in, in a future study. Uh, so, but I want, want you to consider taking time to read that portion. Number one, the will of God was to create. That's the first thing we know about God's will. Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Physical creation speaks, tells us of a creator and he has rights over his creation. Look and understand the repercussions for we are not the product of a biological accident. Whoever you and, and I didn't see creation happen nor did anyone else in the world today, creation is that in that sense, or in this sense, is a theory like evolution. Remember, true science is not the enemy. It is knowing based on observable, provable processes. 
The facts will fit the biblical account. Let's look at these verses. O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. As we look at these words in the Hebrew, uh, we get a, a more definitive statement. It sounds like a simple repetition here, but two different Hebrew words are used. The first one that David uses, uh, the L-O-R-D in capital letters, is Jehovah, self-existent or eternal one. This is followed by the term Lord, Edom, from an unused root meaning to rule, an unused uh, as far as in the, in the scriptures, the root is not found in scriptures, sovereign, that is controller, uh, human or divine. And that's also by strong. So you come up with this uh, phrase when you put the definitions in English into place. O self-existent one, our sovereign controller. Is an excellent, large, or powerful name. If we honestly examine the accessible details of creation all over this planet, we will come to the conclusion that all this intricate design demands a designer. Of course, that's not enough information. But even Satan is busy trying to silence that information. Uh, many unbelievers in the past have, uh, uh, of course, believed in creation, but there's many unbelievers believing in creation. I didn't, as an unbeliever, didn't have any problem with creation. I looked at those things in around me and I saw the amazing design, and so it wasn't a problem to me. However, it is a problem to others because they've been sold something. They are uh, dealing with an issue. The scriptures declare who he is. Our Lord, our Lord is his name. The more we ex accept his message from creation, <clears throat> we see this to be true uh, with the microscope searching the inner working of the designer. And we see this in a message to challenge the honest seeker of his existence. Next phrase. Who have set your glory above the heavens? If man truly consider the heavens, the observable facts place God in our mental path. The design demands that we listen to our creator. The heavens declare the glory of God with every form of probing into the beyond. The creator has made a statement of his excellence, his power, and his glory, grandeur, everywhere we look. We come to the next phrase. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies. The first creation was honored by the Sabbath. And if you look at the Old Testament, uh, that is a theme pointing toward a, of course, a solution uh, coming in the future from God to solve man's dilemma. Keeping the Sabbath in Judaism was rem reminding them of, of their uh, creator. So let's break it down a little further. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants. Nursing. It's just cut the, cut the volume on the production completely. Hmm. I'll go turn that one, uh, that whole thing off here. Maybe that's the the culprit. How about that?
Do I need to speak louder? Is that it? Can you guys hear me when I'm talking? Okay. But it's not being on, put onto the... We don't know, huh? <clears throat> so when they say... Uh, a babe or a nursing infant you'll notice in the notes uh nursing and an inf infant would normally con continue nursing and infant that term would normally con continue to the age of three or four years old think about that gals yeah. I, I've heard the stories from my relatives, so I knew about that happening in my my family in olden days. They didn't have uh, formula. <clears throat> we look at the children and are amazed at what comes out of their mouths. Even from the very beginning of their existence, they are a wonder that if we listen, we will see. And I've watched it. I had the privilege of delivering one of my children on the uh, living room couch. <clears throat> and <clears throat> as, as the delivering, uh, and, and my mother, that's what she did for a job was uh, OB, uh, OB nurse and uh, <clears throat> did a lot of delivery. So I had all the equipment made available to me as far as the clip and gloves and whatever. And my wife was thinking, how long this is this taking? So what are you doing? Well, I was cleaning out Rachel's mouth and her nose. Uh, I was in, in awe. I, I remember seeing my, uh, I had a chance of witnessing my, my son Philip's birth. And uh, I was in awe. I was, it was an old hospital and uh, the, the different parenting situations were just a curtain, you know, and not a separate room, uh, just a curtain and a curtain here. And uh, I was really uncomfortable. And when that, uh, when that happened, when that birthing process came to its conclusion, it, I don't care if we'd done it on Main Street. It didn't, I was just overwhelmed with it. I believe that my experience would not be unique for most parents. I think that is, and I, I think that's why God gave it to me so I could understand this concept. He allowed that to happen to me. Um, and actually, our doctor, Dr. Ness, uh, uh, complimented that I did a really nice job. And, uh, fortunately, Mary had very easy um, births, and that was the problem is because she, she went so quickly. So children are a firsthand testimony of God's power. And as I've watched each of my children, and I remember characteristics I saw within those first hours with those children. And I saw those same traits all through their life, only developed and used. And they were symptomatic of their whole personality. Um, and I won't reveal that data. That gets too much personal. OK. But the, but the point is that they're amazing. And they grow so quickly. And then you look at, at this going on all over this planet and all the, the, the safety systems that God has put into play. Uh, we're going to be looking at some other clips in the days to come. Uh, so please, please try to be here. And we, we, hopefully we can uh, solve some of our problems here. Uh, to do that. 
And I would encourage you to uh, take advantage of them because they are encouraging. The second part of the phrase, uh, the, this statement here, this verse says, you have ordained strength. Strong tells us that this word for strength is used to describe might in various applications. And so this word could be used to express something that's talking about force, something about security, something about majesty. And this is the interesting point. It's something about praise. All right. And I have proof for that in our study. If we would go to, as we look it up further in our notes of Matthew 21, verses 15 and 16. And I... I was able to make this con uh, connection easily because uh, Bible knowledge commentary supports this with Matthew, this, this statement, Matthew 21, 15 through 16. The idea is that the Lord has ordained that the weakness sh weakest shall confound the strong. Uh, Cross-reference 1 Corinthians 1, 27. And here's the verse. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. So how old are these kids? These children. Uh, you know, between... They're able to be walking around. They're able to be saying this, able to project your voice in a uh, organized fashion. Hosanna to the son of David. They were, and of course, the reaction of the chief priests and scribes was what they were indignant and said of him, do not hear what these are saying. And Jesus said to them, yes. So they expected Jesus to be uh, embarrassed by this somehow, I guess. And Jesus said, yes. Have you never read? <laughs> and he quotes this verse we've been looking at. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants. So so the indication is that you had some toddlers running around that could speak, and they were joining in on this. Three, four-year-olds. And Jesus said to them, yes, you have never, yes, have you never heard out of the mouth of babes and nursing events, you have perfected praise. Why? We have a wonderful word here in the, in, the, in the Hebrew, that you may silence. That you may silence the enemy and the avenger. In the end, it is a permanent silence. And this is why it's important to everyone to, to realize the consequences are high if you don't hear God. If you do not choose to humble yourself before his voice and what he's trying to say. For the will of God prevails. It supersedes any human will. This is why submitting to the will of God is important to every human being. Adam and Eve didn't do the will of God in the Garden of Eden. God told them. Adam was warned about the consequences and, and paid the consequences. Adam's choice now would impact the whole human race. God promised and later provided the only solution of reconciliation between God and man. God had to fix it. And we see that beautifully in John 1, 1 through 14. That you may silence. God's creative right over the human race will ultimately be realized. Some will 
be driven to silence. Of course, some will what celebrate. But we will be silenced in respect. All question marks will be gone. We won't be de depending on theories to fill in the gaps in our understanding. God has given lowly man a wonderful place in his creation. God in his sovereignty will, in his sovereign will, it should be, no, this will, is providing salvation or eternal judgment. Enemy. An enemy is a hateful one. Uh, the Hebrew word used here is equivalent to the Greek term for enemy. Man has been given a free will and allowed to make a choice, but remember God is sovereign who gave mankind this choice. And man's realm of choice is quite narrow. And God has the right and reason to judge man's decisions. Not all God's enemies will stay his enemies. Avenger. It takes it from a little different angle. As uh, one who holds a grudge. It's uh, the cause of the hatred. Or... Uh, maybe even a holding on and as uh, a cause for not responding to God's uh, nudging. There are reasons one hold, one would hold to and is blinded by hate. However, when the facts are truly seen, we will understand God is right, but when? Think about these verses. We all were enemies, Romans 5.10, for if when we were enemies, remember that's the same equivalent of that Hebrew word, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Uh, take time to read uh, 2 Corinthians 5.11-21, through 21, because today... Believers are called to participate in the ministry of reconciliation. All in Adam are in trouble. Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Christ was offered in our place, Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And as it is appointed to men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So this is the response of the believer when judgment comes. We have one who has taken our place. And this is the verse, as I was studying, I kept Coming to my mind is Philippians chapter 2, 8 through 11. Both ways, whether you are an unbeliever or a believer, both ways every knee will bow and tongue confess. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We have two main portions uh, that I would encourage you to read. We, uh, we don't have the time to pursue that this week, but I'd like to have you thinking on these things and preparing your mind to uh, allow the Spirit of God to tie things together and make, and make things make more sense to you. 
and help you then to articulate to others uh, truth. Eternal life, read Revelation 4 and 5. The reason why I picked that portion is that you have a heavenly scene and you see believers celebrating. You have the 24 elders. Uh, there are those that uh, believe that these are making reference to the church. Uh, this is a scene during the tribulation period. Uh, talk about being able to be in a different time zone, but what's uh, what, what's what's going on? But we have twenty four elders. This is after the rapture, and this conversation going on between John and and some of the people he encounters. He thinks it's a special. Uh, Dig, uh, being and he wants to bow down and worship to and he said no I'm one of you <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm I'm just a believer I'm a glorified one it's going to be so different and so unique and so special all the tears ultimately will be pa a, a past history that we will not feel anymore our biggest part is our soul keeps on hurting even after uh, items pass. But eternal life is knowing God, as uh, John 17 points out, verse 3. And then in Revelation uh, 19 and 20, those two chapters, read the whole thing in one setting, uh, eternal death. God has a point and a purpose, and we'll understand it more and more, and the judgment seat of Christ will be helpful to us. But the great white throne judgment will be a time of understanding for everyone. But they already be bowing the knee. I believe the context of Philippians 2 is actually at the beginning of the millennium. Uh, that will be taking place. <clears throat> It's not the eternal state. When I considered your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, what you had ordained. Creation is meant to bring us voluntarily to our knees. The logical conclusion is very humiliating to the scientific community. Why? Many have chosen to hold a grudge against the idea of a creator. Human arrogance is very apparent. What is man that you are mindful of him? Why does God even care about mankind? And the son of man that you visit him. And there's a portion that we'll spend some time on. I'm not sure how that will work out completely. I keep changing my notes over and over again. Hebrews 1 and then John 1, 1 through 14. John 3, 14 through 16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, pointing to the cross, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus was telling Nicodemus to look for this. For God so loved the world that he gave. The reason why God did it is not because he had to, because this is what love did God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life shall we pray Heavenly Father we thank you for this time together thank you Father for creation thank you Father for those that are, are taking the time and putting the energy into placing that before men's minds as Satan tries to 
drown our society, with our, especially our young people, in this idea as the, the backdrop to everything, and even uh, confusing believers. Help us, Father, to realize that the truth, no matter what form it is, is liberating. And Father, your truth then gives us purpose for all and every other truth around us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring about us and that it is very important to each and every one of us and all our fr friends and neighbors, uh, everyone we meet on the road of life, they need the Savior. They need the will of God. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, thank you.